Hello, I'm Professor McCoy, and today I want to give a brief introduction to Plato's seminal dialogue, The Republic. Um, it's kind of the cliche at this point um, from uh, uh, philosopher Alfred Whitehead that all of Western philosophy is a series of footnotes to Plato. Uh, and as I say in my syllabus, I don't think that's quite correct, but it's close. Uh, I would say rather that all of Western philosophy has Plato in its footnotes. And a lot of those footnotes are for the Republic. And now a lot of people will use uh, the Republic in different ways. They will cite it for different purposes. Uh, for my purposes and for the purposes of this playlist and most of the uh, most of the analysis videos and lectures on this channel, um, I take uh, a, a particular view of the Republic and I read it mostly as a text on uh, on moral psychology rather than as a political text, social commentary, historical, dramatic, what have you. Um, so it is primarily, uh, by my reading, the Republic is primarily about ethics, meta-ethics, and moral psychology. So how and uh, how we do and how we ought to make ethical decisions. The structure of the Republic is also somewhat unique uh, in Plato's texts. Um, among Plato's dialogues, there is this: there's the classical division between the early or Socratic dialogues. Uh, the middle dialogues, which are seen as more constructive, where Plato is constructing theories of his own. Uh, and then finally, the later dialogues, where Plato is more critiquing his earlier views. The Republic finds itself in a strange place between them. Um, a lot of scholars, uh, myself among them, take the first book of the Republic uh, as a Socratic or early dialogue, uh, where uh, Plato is giving an account of a conversation Socrates has where he examines a concept and uh, attempts to find a definition and then eventually winds up deconstructing the concept or critiquing the concept or even just critiquing the social understanding of the concept. Um, these Socratic dialogues um, typically end in what's called aporia. I've mentioned this before um, in other lectures. This is uh, the best way of, I, I think, the best way of interpreting this is a kind of shrug. Uh, at the end of the dialogue, all of the people who are having the conversation um, might say agree to disagree. Uh, they essentially come to no conclusion. They they conclude that they cannot conclude anything. And so they all go their separate ways, dissatisfied with uh, the way the conversation went. Uh, this is typical of, uh, of what are generally categorized as Plato's early dialogues, because this is what uh, scholars, the majority of scholars, uh, believe that Socrates mostly did around the city of Athens. After the first book of the Republic, however, we transition to something more constructive, where uh, Plato is developing theories. Uh, he is constructing a, an ethical theory, um, a theory of moral psychology, a theory of the virtues, um, and some will argue uh, a political theory. I do have my objections to this, but that will have to be a subject uh, to address in later videos. Uh, for now, it is it, it's important enough to note that uh, this this potential reading of or this potential division of the Republic into two or perhaps three parts. Uh, first being the early uh, book one, um, and then the theory that I think is the most uh, the most plausible. And there are other interpretations for this. But what I take to be the most plausible is that Plato wrote the first book of the Republic early in his career, and later attend addended uh, added on the uh, books. Uh, two through nine, or perhaps two through ten. Uh, there's another distinction there. Um, later on, as something like a sequel. So the end of the first book of the Republic, or the end of the Republic, as it may have been called, um, or the Thrasymachus, perhaps. Um, Thrasymachus being the final dialogue partner of the uh, first book. Ends in Aporia, but Plato comes back later to fill in uh, what may wind up actually being a definition of justice, the topic of discussion. Um, this is primarily in 2 through 9. In 10, we wind up with something like a late, uh, a late dialogue, uh, a critique-style um, dialogue, where we find uh, some of the earlier views being put to the test, being deconstructed, being criticized, being uh, examined more closely and more carefully. Um, we also find uh, something of mythology in the Tenth Book of the Republic, something we find uh, in only a few other places like the Timaeus. Um, this is uh, somewhat distinct from the sort of core of the textbooks two through nine. Uh, so I take, uh, I suspect at least, that the Tenth Book of the Republic is 
uh, is also something of a separate project than uh, book one and then books two through nine. Uh, so as we go through this, as I discuss all of the various parts and pieces in the Republic, uh, keep this division in mind um, that the book one is very much uh, a traditional dialogue, uh, something like the Euthyphro or the Apology, uh, where Socrates is merely criticizing a view, He's criticizing um, the proposed and ultimately failed definitions that his uh, fellow Athenians uh, will bring up for a contentious term, in this case, justice. All right, so looking at uh, either the text as a whole or simply book one, um, typically when you're examining a, a dramatic text, and being a dialogue, this is something of a dramatic text, uh, the theme of the work is, uh, is usually displayed at the beginning by how the work starts. Uh, and that is true of the Republic as a whole uh, by examining book one, uh, because the themes of book one are the themes that are going to be uh, throughout the rest of uh, the following nine books, uh, throughout the rest of the dialogue. But further, I think we can zoom in further and examine the beginning of the first book. And that's most of what I want to do now, um, because the beginning of the first book has uh, themes that will wind up being expounded upon throughout the rest of book one, and then the, the rest of book one winds up being expounded upon further in books two through nine, uh, and even two through ten, really. Um, so how does the book start? Uh, well, I'll quote the beginning paragraph. Uh, I went down to the Piraeus yesterday with Glaucon, son of Ariston. Glaucon being one of the primary dialogue partners in the center books of the Republic. Um, I wanted to say a prayer to the goddess, and I was also curious to see how they would manage the festival, since they were holding it for the first time. I thought the procession of the local residents was a fine one, and that the one concluded by the Thracians was no less outstanding. After, he, after we had said our prayer and seen the procession, we started back towards Athens. Polemarchus saw us from a distance as we were setting off for home and told his slave to run and ask us to wait for him. The slave, slave caught hold of my cloak from behind. Polemarchus wants you to wait, he said. I turned around and asked where Polemarchus was. He's coming up behind you, he said. Please wait for him. Glaucon replied, hey, we will. So much of the themes of the Republic are, uh, are sort of buried in that beginning introductory paragraph of that, those uh, the starting lines. Uh, and uh, what follows very, very shortly afterwards, uh, first of all, we have uh, religious obligation uh, and the virtue of civic piety, which is a major component of justice under any of the considerations that any of the dialogue partners, Socrates included, will propose. Um, our obligations to, uh, to the gods, our obligations to our city, uh, our civic obligations, our obligations to our friends and compatriots, right? all of these wind up being critically important aspects uh, of the Republic that are buried in this very beginning thematic opening. Um, we're also introduced to several of the primary uh, characters. We have Socrates, obviously. We have Glaucon, we have Atis, um, or Paul Marcus, the brother, I believe, of Atis. Um Wrong about that. Um, and then we also have um, a sort of shadow of the political aspects as a sort of stand-in for uh, the more ethical and religious aspects. It goes on, uh, the story goes on, and I won't read, I'll just summarize at this point. Uh, the story goes on for, uh, with Polemarchus catching up uh, to the two friends and demanding that they, explicitly demanding that they come back with him to, uh, to discuss things with, uh, with Polemarchus. Uh, and his father, Cephalus, because this is what Socrates does. He has conversations with people, and it's, it's entertaining. Um, and he, he essentially demands it. Uh, he says that there are more of us than there are of you, so uh, you're going to have to come with us. Uh, in fact, uh, he says, um, Paul Marcus said, it looks to me, Socrates, as if you two were starting off for Athens. It does look that way, I said. Socrates. Um, Do you see how many we are? Paul Marcus responds. I do, Socrates says. Well, you must either prove stronger than we are, or you will have to stay here. Isn't there an alternative, Socrates responds, namely that we persuade you to let us go? But could you persuade us if we won't listen? Certainly not, Glaucon said. This is, again, core, uh, a core theme of all of the Republic. It is this contention between... Um, Dialogue on the one hand, 
logical analysis uh, and uh, and dialectic. And on the other hand, uh, the application of violence. And these are the two competing impulses that so much of uh, the discussion of justice is going to consider. Um, we see that the, also the character here of Paul Marcus is going to represent one of the major theories of justice um, that he proposes here in the first book, which is to help your friends and harm your enemies, that winds up being the uh, what, what Socrates will later go on to describe as the timocratic ideal, or the ideal of military virtue, which he'll then criticize and, and, uh, and go on to show how it degrades into further corrupt forms of, uh, forms of justice and forms of society, etc. So we have here the beginning of uh, all of the themes beginning to, to untangle themselves and show where they're going to go. So we have Paul Marcus. We have his father, Cephalus, who is a, uh, a very old man. And so naturally, Socrates and Cephalus begin discussing uh, old age and what that's like and how it's going to go. Um, and Cephalus brings up, he's the first to bring up the idea of justice because <clears throat> he says that justice becomes a significant concern late in one's life because one has to um, make an account of one's uh, goings on throughout one's life, right? whether that is for the sake of the afterlife, as as Cephalus can, um, implies, uh, or even for the sake of one's family and one's friends and one's associates. Okay. Uh, the end of one's life brings uh, brings into sharp focus the kind of person one is and the kind of life one is led. Uh, this is the theme of remembering one's death or memento mori uh, that later Stoics are. Are so prone to bring up. Uh, this then brings us to the theme of justice and the very traditional understanding of uh, giving to each what they are owed or giving to each their due. Um, and Cephalus's understanding of that, which is to tell the truth and pay your debts, which is the typical first kind of definition that we get in a Socratic dialogue, which is more like a set of examples uh, than it is like a definition. And Socrates, of course, criticizes this and shows its faults. Paul Marcus then brings up his definition. Socrates um, criticizes uh, Paul Marcus's definition of helping your friends and harming your enemies. Uh, I have a separate video as well uh, on that, so uh, I have to go through the playlist. That I spend a good deal of time on that one in particular. Uh, and then finally, the longest section of book one uh, is uh, dealing with Thrasymachus, a noted sophist, the classical enemies of Plato and Socrates intellectual enemy at the very least. <clears throat> uh, and Thrasymachus proposes, finally, um, two sort of competing definitions for justice. One is that justice is the advantage of the stronger. Uh, this is the sort of legal positive positivist view, that justice is whatever the ruler says it is. And then, uh, once Socrates handily defeats him, because Polemarchus is not a particularly skilled um, logician, he is a very skilled uh, rhetorician. He has prepared speeches, which is the way that the sophists operate. Um, once Socrates defeats his initial view, Thrasymachus comes back and argues that justice is uh, not a virtue, but a vice. Uh, it is weaker than injustice, right? Injustice is what we ought to strive for if we're capable of doing so, and justice is just compensation if we're unable to be sufficiently unjust. And again, this is the primary challenge of the rest of the text. And Socrates is struggling with this view long after Thrasymachus leaves the conversation at the end of book one. Um, he's struggling with this idea of trying to show that justice is, in fact, better than injustice. So that is, I think, the central theme of the book. And you'll notice I've barely mentioned, after this initial, uh, the initial discussion of civic piety, I've barely discussed politics at all, despite the book being called The Republic, right? The res publica, public thing in Latin, as it was titled. Um, because again, the dialogues were typically titled, titled after they were written by Latin scholars rather than Greek scholars. That's a very unimportant side issue. I emphasize this because of another uh, very important interpretive lens that I at least am going to be taking dogmatically in my reading of the Republic for this series and for um, probably all of the lectures on this channel. And that is that the political aspects of the Republic are purely allegorical, or I'm going to be reading them as purely allegorical. 
The entire point of the political aspects of the Republic, political discussions, is to illuminate the justice of an individual soul or an individual person. Um, we'll get more into this uh, in book two, because that is where the analogy really is, uh, is made explicit. Uh, but it is important to note from the beginning that all of this political discussion uh, that we find in the Republic, um, the whole point of this is, uh, is as an analogy to show, uh, to look at what justice looks like in a city or in a civilization uh, is just sort of a large scale blown up model uh, to try and figure out what justice ought to look like on the small scale of the individual person. So that's the goal. That is what they're after. And that, and that is clear enough here from the beginning of the text, right? Uh, right from the start, uh, we are concerned about uh, what, the, what is the just way of behaving as a person rather than what is the just way of organizing a society, uh, which is the larger political question uh, that, again, I, is um, largely a side note and is largely just an illustration uh, in the Republic, throughout the dialogue of the Republic. All right, so hopefully this gives us enough of a uh, enough of groundwork uh, to move on from here and to go through this step by step, uh, perhaps skipping around a little bit um, as I construct the lecture course. Uh, but hopefully we will go through enough of the Republic to get a solid grasp of uh, of all of the key points uh, that Socrates is throughout, or I should say, Plato is making throughout through the voice of Socrates, which is another aspect that we wrestle with. So with that, uh, I will leave you until next time. Thanks for listening, and I hope that you will stick around for the other lectures having to do with Plato's Republic, uh, as I do, I do really think that it is one of the most foundational works of Western philosophy, um, and this will be a useful, uh, this in particular will be a useful video, and the others will be a useful series, uh, and hopefully, hopefully a relatively engaging series. Until next time.